In the past 12 months, more than 100,000 Americans have died from a drug overdose. That's more than the peak number of HIV deaths at the height of the HIV crisis, the peak number of car accident deaths per year, or deaths from firearms per year. Hi, I'm Dr. Sarah Wakeman. I'm a general internist and addiction medicine specialist, and I'm medical director for substance use disorders at Mass General Brigham. I'm an associate professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School. And this is Clues to Cures, History of the Search for Effective Treatment for Substance Use Disorder. A substance use disorder is defined as compulsively using alcohol or drugs despite bad things happening to you. So this means losing control over your use, continuing to use despite consequences in your health or your relationships, your ability to work. There are different types of substance use disorder, but the ones that we most commonly see in clinical practice are alcohol use disorder, tobacco use disorder, opioid use disorder, and stimulant use disorder, which is methamphetamine or cocaine use. Historical trends of the current overdose crisis began in the late 1990s with what's called the first wave of the opioid epidemic, which is deaths due to prescription opioids. The second wave came around 2010 with rising deaths due to heroin. The third wave began around 2013 with rapidly rising deaths caused by illicitly manufactured fentanyl. Many people would say we're in the fourth wave now, which is really a polysubstance crisis, which started somewhere around 2019, where we continue to see deaths being driven by illicitly manufactured fentanyl, and at the same time, rising rates of cocaine and methamphetamine-involved deaths as well. Historically, we've made addiction treatment really difficult to get. We make it incredibly complicated to navigate the system. Families and patients are often left on their own to navigate a complicated system, often facing waiting lists or delays in getting into care, and then even even after accessing care, much of what's called addiction treatment is really not rooted in evidence. This is really the opposite of what you'd want to see if you were designing an ideal system to take care of people who are already marginalized and at high risk of death. What we should be doing is dropping barriers to care, opening doors up wide and welcoming people into treatment, making it as easy as possible for people to access care, and that's simply not how it's been historically. Today, there are four main treatments for substance use disorder, medications, psychosocial treatments, recovery supports, and harm reduction. There are FDA-approved and effective medication treatments for alcohol use disorder, opioid use disorder, and tobacco use disorder. And while these medications should be made available with psychosocial treatments, like counseling or therapy, whether or not a person is interested or able to engage in those additional treatments, they should absolutely have immediate access to life-saving medication treatment. For other types of substance use disorder, the mainstay of treatment are psychosocial treatments, things like cognitive behavioral therapy or contingency management. Contingency management is a type of therapy that rewards people for positive health-seeking behaviors like showing up for treatment. Health insurance companies actually use this type of approach. So if you've ever been reimbursed for your gym membership, you've actually engaged in contingency management, and it's an incredibly powerful way of motivating behavior change. Recovery supports are things like peer support or recovery coaches. We at Mass General Brigham use recovery coaches across a range of settings. These are people in long-term recovery themselves who are not clinicians, but are essential, invaluable members of the care team who can provide support to patients based on their shared lived experience. And then lastly, harm reduction, which is focusing on reducing the negative consequences of use, irrespective of whether someone makes changes to their alcohol or drug use. This is an approach that's rooted in patient-centeredness, respecting the dignity and autonomy of the people we're caring for, and also backed by evidence. One of the best known models of harm reduction are syringe service programs, which give sterile syringes to people who inject drugs and have been shown to reduce the spread of HIV and also to lead to engagement around a number of other health-related behaviors. By simply thinking about and caring for people who use drugs and people with substance use disorder in a different way, we could see tens of thousands of lives saved each year. Here at Mass General Brigham, we're focused on innovating around care delivery and equity in everything that we do. That's especially important because of racial disparities in access to treatment and clinical outcomes, including overdose death rates across the country. There's a huge gap between what's been shown to work in science and clinical trials and what actually happens in practice. One thing we're focusing on at Mass General Brigham is our bridge clinic model, which is a novel, innovative approach that was started at Mass General Hospital, and we're now expanding across all of Mass General Brigham. 
It's also a model that's being adopted at hospitals across the United States. Bridge clinics are a walk-in, drop-in, low-threshold care model, which allow people with substance use disorder immediate access to effective addiction treatment delivered with compassion and dignity. As people stabilize over a period of months, they then transition their care back to community-based settings like primary care or specialty substance use disorder clinics. Thanks for watching. For more videos on substance use, you can click here. And don't forget to subscribe clicking here.